the second spring of the Civil War approaches. Each passing week, the southern states strengthen their positions. After eight months of inaction, General George McClellan is prepared to lead the Army of the Potomac into Virginia, and possibly all the way to the Confederate capital at Richmond. General Joseph Johnston's Confederate Army at Manassas stands in McClellan's way. To the west, an army under Stonewall Jackson occupies the Shenandoah Valley, protecting the breadbasket of the state. To break the deadlock, McClellan uses more than 300 vessels to transfer his army to Fort Monroe, a Union citadel at the tip of Virginia's peninsula. The peninsula is formed by the York River to the north and the James River to the south. Both are navigable for long distances. Ocean-going ships can steam as far upriver as Richmond. With more than 120,000 men just 70 miles from Richmond, McClellan is well positioned to wreak havoc on Virginia. In response, Johnston transfers his army to the peninsula. It assumes a blocking position around Yorktown, famous as the site of British surrender in the Revolutionary War. The Confederates enjoy advantages at the outset. Heavy batteries at Gloucester Point, opposite Yorktown, close the York River to the U.S. Navy. The CSS Virginia is a wall of iron guarding the James. To undermine these obstacles, McClellan lays siege to Yorktown and brings up his heavy guns. The Confederate Navy is forced to scuttle the Virginia. To protect his smaller force, Johnston retreats up the peninsula. McClellan gives chase, but a heavy fight at Williamsburg on May 5th slows the pursuit, allowing Johnston to fall back. To protect the city from the Union Navy, a fort springs up on Drury's Bluff, seven miles below Richmond. It is 90 feet above the water. The defenders place obstructions to block the channel. U.S. Navy Secretary Gideon Wells sends a five-ship strike force toward Richmond. It includes the world-famous USS Monitor. John Rogers is in command, and his orders from Wells are to reach Richmond and blast the city into submission. On May 15th, Rogers reaches Drury's Bluff. In a four-hour battle, the defenders stand firm. The next effort against Richmond will come by land. By mid-May, some of McClellan's army has reached the city's outskirts at Seven Pines. The swampy Chickahominy River divides the army. Southerners fear another siege. General Johnston acts first striking the vulnerable Federal Fourth Corps at Seven Pines on May 31st. Heavy rains have swollen the river, hampering the divided Union Army. D.H. Hill and James Longstreet's Confederate divisions fight their way to the field. But General Edwin Sumner's Second Corps wades the treacherous river and marches to the rescue. The Confederate attack stalls and Army Commander Johnston is badly wounded. After two days and 11,000 casualties, the status quo prevails. Johnston's wounding paves the way for a new commander, General Robert E. Lee. He opens his headquarters at the Dabbs House east of Richmond and within days, he formulates a plan to regain the initiative and save the city. The massive Federal Army is supplied by the Richmond and York River Railroad, which stretches east to White House Landing on the Pamunkey River. McClellan's supply line becomes Lee's opportunity. Lee plans to bring Jackson's army from the west to Richmond. 
he will use maneuvers to threaten that railroad in hopes of preempting the pending siege. On June 26th, Lee strikes. Jackson sweeps above the left flank of Fitz John Porter's Fifth Corps at Mechanicsville, but he is later than expected. A.P. Hill's Confederate division forces its way across the Chickahominy at Meadow Bridges. George McCall's Pennsylvania reserves wheel into powerful defenses behind Beaver Dam Creek. With no sign of Jackson, Hill's brigades attack eastward from Mechanicsville, but are smashed along the banks of Beaver Dam Creek. Despite the victory, McClellan sees no way to save his railroad. That night, he decides to retreat to the James River. The surprised men of the 5th Corps retreat that night, but are ordered to stay north of the river one more day. McClellan wants time to concentrate his army, abandon White House Landing, and begin his James River movement. Lee unleashes his army in full pursuit. He hopes to cut the railroad and fight a decisive battle. Jackson makes an end-around march, hoping to get behind the Federals. But the Fifth Corps moves into position near Gaines's Mill with its back to the Chickahominy River. 60,000 Confederates face 27,000 Federals with six hours of daylight remaining. Lee attacks across a two-mile front. McClellan counters by sending Slocum's 6th Corps Division to the 5th Corps' aid. It is not enough. After some of the most savage fighting of the war, the Confederates finally smash through the line near sunset and win for Lee his first battlefield victory. Only darkness saves the 5th Corps. That evening, McClellan convenes his corps commanders and announces that the army will retreat to the James. The supply depot at Savage's Station is to be destroyed. The army begins its march. Lee is slow to realize that his foe is on the run. He pursues, spreading his army onto four different roads. A sharp but indecisive battle erupts at Savage's Station between General Magruder's Confederate divisions and a strong Union rearguard. The Confederates deploy an innovative weapon, a railroad gun. McClellan is forced to abandon his sick and wounded at Savage's Station. McClellan's army faces two obstacles on the way to the James. White Oak Swamp and the crossroads at Glendale. Stonewall Jackson catches up with two federal divisions at the swamp, but fails to get across the water. UG is blocked at the Charles City Road. Holmes stalls on the river road. Longstreet and A.P. Hill have better success. Twelve Confederate brigades mass for the attack on either side of the Long Bridge Road. A permanent breakthrough there will slice the Army of the Potomac in two. The fighting is high drama, hand to hand, and often for the possession of roaring cannon. Union General George Meade is wounded. His division commander, General McCall, is captured. The Confederates seize 16 cannon. The Union line sags and briefly breaks, but it holds until dark. The battle is called Glendale in the north and Fraser's Farm in the south. By the next morning, most of McClellan's army is on Malburn Hill, close to the James River. Navy warships offer protection and the terrain is perfect for defense. The Union troops invite an attack, 
Lee obliges. The Confederate Army is shredded at Malvern Hill on July 1st. Botched staff work leads to piecemeal attacks. Union artillery is king of the field. Lee's army suffers more than 5,000 casualties and is soundly defeated in a battle it never should have fought. The Army of the Potomac marches away in the darkness, ending what would be known as the Seven Days Battles. McClellan finds safety at Harrison's Landing on the James River. He evacuates his wounded, rests his men, receives reinforcements, and prepares to restart his campaign. President Lincoln visits the Army and instead decides to remove it from the landing in August. The five-month-long Peninsula Campaign is the largest military operation in American history up to that time. The Confederates save Richmond and take the initiative. Within weeks, the war will move again to Manassas and then across the Potomac River and on into the North where new chapters of American history will be written.